This is Thinking in Public, a program dedicated to intelligent conversation about frontline theological and cultural issues with the people who are shaping them. I'm Albert Moa, your host and president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. D.G. Hart is Distinguished Associate Professor of History at Hillsdale College in Michigan. He earned the Master of Theological Studies from Harvard University before earning his Ph.D. at Johns Hopkins University. His degree was in American history. Professor Hart is a renowned historian of American history. He's written 13 books on a range of topics, including American evangelicalism, J. Gresham Machen, American Protestantism, but his most recent book is American Catholic, The Politics of Faith During the Cold War, which chronicles the intersection between Roman Catholicism, American conservatism, and American nationalism at a crucial time in the nation's history. His book, American Catholic, is the topic of our conversation today. Professor Hart is a friend of many years, more than 30 years, and about 30 years ago, we co-edited a book together. I'm looking forward to updating our conversation. Daryl Hart, Welcome to Thinking in Public. Thanks for having me, and it's good to be with you. Yeah, I think uh, it was uh, now approaching 35 years ago that we found ourselves uh, unexpectedly in a room together uh, as part of a uh, an academic research project. And uh, at that point, uh, I wasn't even myself 35 years old. I couldn't imagine knowing people for more than 35 years. Yeah, I was going back over that with my wife uh, either yesterday morning or this morning, thinking about when we first met and and the circumstances. And uh, it's 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 been a long time. It, it has been, and the interesting thing is, is that uh, back then, uh, you know, thirty five years ago, we were considering together the future of religion in America, and uh, now we're living it. Right. right exactly. Yeah. You've been chronicling American religion as a very prolific uh, author and historian, and your latest book is entitled American Catholic, The Politics of Faith During the Cold War. And I want to tell you, even if you were not the author of this book, uh, I would have pre-ordered it and, uh, and waited with anticipation for it, because this is a, uh, an issue that is very, very important to me, and I'm really glad you gave the attention to it. Well, thanks. I'm curious to know why that is, but um, it's... I've been working in conservative circles for almost 20 years now and um, and Roman Catholics uh, to their credit dominate that world considerably. And so I've been learning a lot about Roman Catholicism since then and trying to figure out the connections to conservatism. And it's uh, been very useful for me, even for thinking about the ways that Christians in general, Protestants specifically think relate to the public realm. Yeah, I am what uh, the uh, 17th century Roman Catholic Church would call an obstinate Protestant. Uh, so, in other words, I am, uh, I am absolutely Protestant. But I think uh, going all the way back to the Reformation, the big question for any legitimate Protestant is the Roman Catholic Church and what it means. And a continuing uh, conversation that preceded the Reformation, but of course came to uh, to a, a cataclysmic uh, height in the Reformation itself. But as a young uh, Christian myself, just trying to think these things through, and as a young conservative, I found myself reading Roman Catholics, uh, William F. Buckley Jr., just give one example, or a Catholic convert such as Russell Kirk, and uh, and trying to figure out what what those connections were, and then when I did my doctoral work, I I, I did two doctoral seminars in a Roman Catholic institution studying Roman Catholic uh, theological method, uh, trying to understand uh, these things, and uh, I would also say this, uh, I think uh, most most conservatives today, most conservative evangelicals, let me put it that way today, would think that. Uh, Conservative Roman Catholics and conservative Protestants have been making a lot of the same arguments on moral and, say, religious liberty issues for a long time. And that's not actually the case. Uh, we are part of a conversation now that is unique and can only be explained by history, and, and, and precisely the history that you chronicle in this book. Right. And I, I would go back and just preface my uh, response to saying I am also deeply committed Protestant I've become more so in studying Roman Catholicism, and that's not to take anything away from uh, the church or the Roman Catholics that I hold in high regard as friends and colleagues. But um, salvation is a different matter from 
institutional Christianity, which is also different from how the church relates to public life. Uh, but, e you know, even what you say about the conversation between Roman Catholics and Protestants going on right now, which is probably, I would say, about about as old as when we first met. It may be a little bit right. older than that with evangelicals and Catholics together. Although, actually, that's about that the same after. time. That came after we, we met, right. actually. Yeah. I keep thinking, I, I'm thinking, actually, of uh, Richard John Newhouse's book, The Protestant, um, I mean, The Catholic Moment, which is was mid-'80s, and the um, Naked Public Square, which was also the mid-'80s, and he was still a Lutheran at that point. But um, my other work on evangelicals and conservatism made me aware of how little evangelicals, which is a broad category that we could parse, but we're not talking about them right now, but how little that they were paying attention to people like Kirk and Buckley and National Review. And that's still a mystery to me in some ways, why a group of Americans who would have been quite naturally a readership and a, and a constituency or an alliance with those earlier um, Catholic conservatives weren't, weren't reading them, but, but they weren't pretty much. I mean, yeah, it's, or, or at least they weren't talking about it out loud. So I, I can just tell you in my personal life, I graduated from high school in 1977 and uh, I was basically the singular reader of national review in the high school library. <laughs> Uh, uh, but I was very thankful it was there. And, and basically I didn't have a bibliography. I just worked out of the magazine and, and, you know, so I'd see a column by Russell Kirk. So I try to find a book by Russell Kirk and the public library had a couple. So I, I, and, and then William F. Buckley Jr. But, uh, my conservative evangelical church life and my conservative, you know, intellectual, political and philosophical life weren't the same life. Um, uh, until later, uh, when I, I came to understand the, the, uh, the seamlessness, so to speak, of these issues together. But at at, at a time I was reading, I, I could find evangelicals who were reading William F. Buckley Jr., but they thought his Catholicism was just like uh, uh, an accident. In, in other words, they weren't really connecting to the fact that uh, there, there was Catholic moral theory and Catholic dogmatic history behind a William F. Buckley Jr. Right. Uh, although there are times when I think... Buckley, and I don't know when you want to get into the specifics of the book, but Buckley and and those conservatives around uh, National Review um, were not as theological, and the magazine wasn't designed to be either, as say f compared to First Things, which is sort of the other um, bookend to the to the the narrative I'm trying to tell. But um, I mean, someone like Gary Wills, I think was trained as a Jesuit or at least for a time in a Jesuit seminary. And he, in some ways, was probably more aware of um, church teaching in ways than Buckley was. Buckley had just grown up in the church, was a, held on uh, for a long time to the Latin mass and, and that kind of traditional uh, piety. But on the other hand, there are times when it seemed to me he was not thinking as deeply about how to integrate his faith and his politics. And he was in some ways closer of all things, maybe to Al Smith, who was, yeah. who had not really spent a lot of time thinking about it either, but Didn't it's even later. Didn't even know what a papal encyclical was. Right. But it's later people like Newhouse and George Weigel yeah. and uh, Michael Novak, who are uh, much more um, at least trying yeah. to reflect right. on the tradition in relation to politics. Yeah. I tried to speak carefully. It, it's a, it's a, it's a Catholic tradition that produces a Buckley, even when Buckley's not thinking in ways that are intentionally Catholic. But there's a big story behind this, a lot more interesting, I think, than most people could ever imagine. And I think the history is mistold. So let, let me just offer something, and then uh, I, I want to get right to your book. And what I want to offer is this, that if you talk to the average member of the media, and I had that experience this morning talking to a, a very well-placed person in the national media about even just some of these issues. Or, or even an academic uh, in, in, in many fields, the, the, the rationale that, that they will give for their understanding of the world comes down to their rendering of a Catholic history in the United States as being, there once was a time when Catholicism had an awkward relationship to the, uh, the democratic project of the United States. But John F. Kennedy solved all those problems and, uh, and, and showed that there was no basic conflict whatsoever. 
and uh, and and then you know you just fast forward to the to the fact that now there there couldn't be imaginable uh, any condition in which there'd be a theological obstacle to Catholic participation in the United States, uh, and so it's like John F. Kennedy, 1960, is the hinge that demonstrated there was no problem, but that's not the truth at all. And first of all, it's not the truth that there wasn't a problem. Uh, one of your chapters is entitled uh, "Belonging to an Ancient Church in a Modern Republic," but I mean, well into the 20th century, the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church was that the American experiment was heresy. Right. Well, at least what was heresy was adapting the church, and adapt is can be a broad term, was a was a heresy. And that's going back to Leo the Thirteenth's encyclical Testem Bene- Benevolentiae, 1899, which is in many respects, directed in some ways at debates among traditionalists in Europe uh, than it is more to Amer- the American church. But um, but Americanism is cited as a heresy, which, as you yes. say, is technically the, res- the, the adaptation of Roman Catholicism to an American democratic ethos, but also to the, the, uh, the, the Catholic settlement of uh, of uh, not seeking religious supremacy in, in the of the American experiment, right? And and that's what really drew me to this project was the, the idea that Americanism was a heresy. Um, in some ways, Americanism also got mixed in in 1907, I believe, with um, Pius the uh condemnation of modernism, and Americanism was. Th- considered to be sort of an outgrowth of, of modernism. And since I've studied Protestants, the fundamentalist modernist controversy, I mean, there's a similar work going on in, in the late 19th, but even century before that, um, where Protestants and Roman Catholics are tr- having to adjust to the modern world, and they're figuring out ways to do it. Protestants aren't institutionally situated or invested the way Roman Catholics are. So it may be easier in denominational or congregational structures to, to adapt um, and not having a pontiff overseas. But but both are working with similar um, questions. And that's also what made it very interesting for me not to look at this as merely, oh, this is a Roman Catholic problem, but this is actually a Christian problem that Protestants are also working through in different stages, in different iterations or chapters. Yeah, but also with a different ecclesiology, to say the very least, right. and a different understanding of, uh, of of what will be the optimal relation of the church and the state. Because up until Vatican II, actually, I mean, because you got you also have Pius the Ninth, the longest serving pope of all, who uh, with the syllabus of errors identified modern liberal, which would mean democratic politics, as uh, as heretical. And, and and to be condemned by the church and opposed by all faithful Catholics, and and then you know you you have uh, Leo as you said, then then Pius the tenth, and you're well into the twentieth century, and and uh, so I think to make your point, the the Protestants in the United States kind of felt themselves in charge and and in the center of the culture, so that was a, that was a different situation. But the point I want to make is that, that by the time John F. Kennedy arrives uh, on the scene. Uh, the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church has not yet changed. You, you would hear people say that the Protestant concerns about a Catholic in the presidency were insane, but that's anachronistic. They they certainly weren't I- irrational. Exactly. Um, and and what you were saying earlier about whoever you were talking to in the media about this narrative, it's since I teach religion in America here and uh, we have a fair number of Roman Catholic students at Hillsdale college. I mean, they don't know this history either. They, they pretty much buy the same narrative that somehow Kennedy or that era of Vatican II fixed it, but they don't, they don't know anything really about the syllabus of errors. They don't know about how hardline the papacy was from the French revolution down to the cold war era. Um, And, and, you know, what priests, theologians, bishops know, I've discovered is oftentimes very different from what the laity know as well. Yeah. And, and again, even academics, because uh, I'm constantly confronted with both in, in conversation and in, in reading the fact that, uh, th- that, that there's just this 
this near consensus that it was wrong, uh, like I say, almost irrational, unreasonable, unfair, prejudicial, uh, to think that there might be a problem with a Roman Catholic in the White House uh, in, in the late 1950s and in the, the election of 1960, when actually the Roman Catholic leadership in this country was as concerned about it as fundamentalist Protestants. Right. Well, and, and, and to, to get way ahead of ourselves here, and but I know you've had Patrick Deneen on, on your podcast way back when, and the rise of the anti-liberalism, anti-America strain that in some ways Patrick represents and the integralists, and I don't know that Patrick would consider himself that, but I know he hangs around with people like Adrian Vermeule, a con law professor at Harvard. I mean, they are actually using arguments that that um, Paul Blanchard, they're, they're using arguments against America and against liberalism now that Paul Blanchard was using in 1949. And yet they're Roman Catholics holding on to a more traditional view of the church and its relation to the state. And and so again, within the Roman Catholic world, even to this day, how as as assimilated as it has become to the modern world, post Vatican II, you still have strains, you still have bubbling of the effect of no, this we should have a more church dominant, church centric kind of politics. Yeah, I, I will just say this. I want to go back in history uh, right after I say this, but I, I, I did tell another reporter just recently, you don't understand the situation. American evangelicals are not afraid that a Catholic politician will be too Catholic. That was a concern in 1960. <laughs> the concern now is that the Catholic politician is not Catholic enough. And, and as we say, we're taking salvation out of that picture. Talk about public policy. Um uh, but the concern of, uh, of American evangelicals about Joe Biden is not that he's too Catholic in his moral convictions, but that he's not Catholic enough. Mm-hmm. And to get to that flipped coin, it is a fascinating story. And uh, I just want to ask you to begin it, kind of like you begin the book. What, what, what was the predicament of, uh, of Catholics in the early Amer- American experience? Well, they were incredibly small, roughly 30,000. This is at the time of the founding. Um, I think I get these numbers correctly, 30,000 out of 3 million. So it's not as if the United States was huge by that point then, but they were largely centered in Maryland, Maryland having, having been a, um, a colony founded by uh, Roman Catholic, English Roman Catholics who, who that, that changed over the, t- over time in the 17th century, but a very English dominated church. Um, and, at that point, it was it made all sorts of sense for the Vatican not really to pay any attention to America because America was a it was basically a spinoff of of England, a Protestant country, an English speaking country, and and at that time, Rome had far more on its plate coming out of France and the French Revolution and Napoleon, etc. So it wasn't until waves of immigration come to America mid 19th century Irish large Irish, but also German populations, and then Eastern, Southern European in the late 19th and early 20th century, that you have this polyglot, multicultural, um, melting pot kind of church in America. And even then, the Vatican doesn't pay America all that much attention because it's basically a former colonial society still dominated by Protestants, still English-speaking predominantly. So let the bishops sort of figure it out. And, I mean, to make the story shorter, after World War II, when the United States becomes the leader of the free world, partly because European nations are no longer in a position to try to vie for that, that control, then Rome, which is also very anti-communist, uh, looks to the United States much more seriously as a player in world politics and a, and a player that the Vatican needs to uh, work with in, in some way. So the United States between 19, 1790 and 1950 is a dramatically different nation and Vatican has always adjusted to world powers, and that you see that happen over the course of U.S. history. Uh, you've been a guest in our home for a meal. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, that house is a replica of Homewood. Uh, I do recall that. Which yes. you connect to because you're, you did your doctoral work at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, and uh, his his house and lawn at Homewood basically became the the center of what would become the campus of, of of Johns Hopkins. But he was the only Roman Catholic signer of the Declaration. And it's interesting that even the architecture of his house says that as he was a Roman Catholic, he sent every signal of belonging to the Protestant establishment in terms of power, architecture, uh, et cetera. Right. Right. Exactly. So. And I I I do think that Amer the American Roman Catholics, perhaps because of some kind of benign neglect, um, were able, especially lay Roman Catholics, were able to do, operate in all sorts of American ways and not have to think twice about wait, am I a Roman Catholic or am I American? The bishops obviously had to pay more attention having been appointed by Rome and having to report to Rome in certain ways. And between both oh, 1850 and even to this day, you have bishops who are cardinals or archbishops who have large dioceses and are major players. But that really changed as far as their ability to manage their diocese and their, and their parishioners and sort of make recommendations about what not movies movies not to see that kind of micromanaging of Roman Catholic life, that kind of bishop, which was the case in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Baltimore, fades away after Vatican II. So even then, Roman Catholic lady have even greater freedom, seemingly, than they would have had before that. But when it came to just operating in political life, people like an Al Smith, as I mentioned it, talk about it in the book. He doesn't know what an encyclical is. He's never had to confront what this was. He's been operating in New York City and New York State politics, a product of Tammany Hall. And he never thought anything was amiss with taking vows to uphold the U.S. Constitution, the New York State Constitution. This is just living in the United States. What's the problem? But the Al Smith candidacy did reveal the fact that uh, Americans had a major concern about a Catholic uh, as commander in chief, not as governor of New York, but but as uh, as the nation's commander in chief, chief executive. That seemed to be, I mean, not by a small margin, but uh, but by what probably shocked even voters at the time. That turned out to be a pretty conclusive judgment at the time. It was. Um, it didn't hurt Smith or help Smith. Excuse me that he was also anti-prohibition. And my first book on Jay Gresham Machen, who was a Democrat and a libertarian of a kind, I still recall reading with surprise when I was in the archives as a younger person, um, that here you had um, Machen supporting Smith in part because he was anti-prohibition. And it's not that Machen liked to drink or whatever, but he didn't think the federal government should have that kind of power. So, but anyway, that was another kind of strike in an ethno-cultural mix of, of, um, of issues that could have hurt Smith, and it, and it obviously did. Right. And, and yet at the same time, you had pretty uh, uh, thundering uh, statements coming from the Vatican about continuing concerns about American democracy and, and for that matter, uh, modern Western democratic forms of government. And so uh, the Roman Catholic Church did not help Al Smith to be elected, you might say. And in, in th that is, Rome did not help him in 1920. Right. I think you're right. And and there, um, this fellow, James Chapel, I believe, or Chappell, who teaches at Duke, has a book out called him. Um, Catholic modern, and it's a study of Roman Catholicism in the 20th century in Europe. And and I just finished a, teaching a course on Western heritage from 1600 to the present, which does a lot with Europe. And I continue to be amazed at <laughs> that, that European politics is going to sound so naive, but they don't have a Democratic and Republican Party. They're oftentimes the options are fascism or communism, and if you're or royalism. And if you're trying to sort out those options, it would be really hard for a church to identify with which of these is the, is the proper way to go politically. Um, and, and again, Roman Catholics in the United States are facing nothing on that order 
of real deep dilemmas about where to put put your political support. Um, so again, somebody like Smith could just cruise along in democratic politics, both city, state, and even to a certain extent, national level. And, you know, I can also th th see why the bishops in the United States didn't think it was terribly difficult to operate in an American environment where they had great freedom, um, where even uh, they had great freedom to set up parochial schools, even though that cost parents sending their children or it cost the church something more to do that. And of course, there was there was great opposition to Americans opting out of the public school system, which was the great institution for assimilating immigrants. But but still, the Roman Catholic Church could set those up and face some blowback, but still operate with a full spectrum of spiritual and other services for their yeah. parishioners. I was uh, just out of my own historical interest looking at American news weeklies uh, from the period of the early 60s. Uh, time Newsweek as it developed over time, but basically it's Time and then uh, U.S. News and World Report, uh, but Time Magazine most importantly. And, and just looking at Time, it's evident uh, behind the whole Henry Luce empire of Time Life Incorporated, th there's a there's a shift that takes place. Um, I would argue there in the early 1960s, where it's all it's at one point big news that Americans might elect a Catholic president, and then after that, it's that was no big deal. Uh, that that this is America. That's the way it's basically always been. Let's move on. Um, but in a period of of real cultural and moral and political tumult, there's a lot going on that requires some explanation. And in your book, you very helpfully uh, look at at one figure who's indispensable to this, and that's John Courtney Murray, Jesuit thinker, uh, who uh, was originally uh, basically hated by Rome, and then. Uh, more or less uh, acknowledged by Rome, but without him, you can't tell the story. So I want to let you tell that story. Well, he, 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 I don't know a whole lot about his writing or career before Paul Blanchard's book, which was a bestseller in 1949, um, American Freedom and Catholic Power, or maybe it's Catholic Power and American Freedom. I can never get it right. But um, bestseller, Book of the Month Club, uh, brought out all the old canards from Protestants, whether Orthodox or liberal. And, and Blanchard was himself barely a Protestant at that point, some kind of Unitarian. But um, Murray wanted to defend Roman Catholicism, and he starts to write on church-state relations, and he makes a case for the American founding coming out of a natural law tradition and the Roman Catholic Church rep representing that tradition, of course, through the Middle Ages and, and beyond. And so he, he does an intellectual genealogy of that tradition to locate the founding there as one that is congenial for recognizing harmony between Roman Catholic traditions, political traditions, and the Anglo-American political ones as well. Now, if you go deep into the literature, and I haven't gone real deep, I've, I've, I have gone into this maybe four foot part of the pool with Murray, and there's a lot. Um, you know what? How he was interpreting Leo the Thirteenth, and he he makes some moves of a historicist nature to say that Murray, that sorry, that Leo is writing at a particular time, and Roman Catholic statements on church-state relations emerge out of particular historical context. But the church is now in a different one in the 1950s. That's a that's a an argument that oftentimes modernist or liberal Protestants and the same for Roman Catholics would make about church teachings in theology as well. So I could understand why some may think that Murray was doing something that was uh, maybe dangerous, borderline dangerous at least. But still, he makes a very prominent case, and it is the case for Americanism, or neo-Americanism may be a better way of putting it, that people like Richard John Newhouse, when he founds First Things, um, George Weigel and, and those writers at First Things 
up until maybe recently, and I saw you had Rusty Reno recently on your podcast, and I really, really want to hear that. Um, but but Murray really does dominate for about, you could argue, 30 to 40 years, the way Roman Catholics in America reconcile themselves to the American political tradition represented in the, in the founding itself. So he's a huge figure, and he prevails in many respects – at Vatican II, there's a, there's a question of whether the Vatican will even allow him to be a theological advisor at Vatican II, but the American bishops prevail, and he's very influential. He's not the only voice, but he's very influential in the Vatican's, uh, Vatican II statement on religious freedom, which, is, again, is a huge breakthrough in Roman Catholic teaching about church-state matters. Yep. So may, may I try to summarize this? Because uh, Murray's a, 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 a thinker of fascination to me. Um, uh, in the same way that Karl Barth is, so to speak, you know, uh, I wrote my dissertation on uh, the evangelical response to Barth, and uh, I am profoundly not a Bardian, but you can't tell the story of 20th century theology without Barth. Um, and, and I would say that in a lot of ways, John Courtney Murray is a Catholic like unto Barth, and uh, people sometimes refer to Barth and uh, and that whole movement as neo orthodoxy. Uh, wouldn't exactly fit Murray, but what he does is this. He 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 basically, if I if I'm a traditionalist Roman Catholic, I'm going to say he uh, he makes a place for Catholic politics, but he basically eviscerates the Catholic faith. I know he's not here to defend himself. Uh, if I'm a Catholic liberal, then I think well he's kind of an entryway, but he doesn't take the argument far enough. But his argument, as you say, was based in natural law. But it it comes down to this in the political moment of the 1950s and and into the 60s. It comes down to the argument that a Catholic in the American order may work for public good, for, for human goods, even transcendent goods, but on a completely secular basis. And, uh, and that's exactly what, uh, what Roman said could not happen. Uh, you know, in, in other words, the, the, the Catholic had to be self-consciously Catholic, making Catholic arguments that were subject to approval or disapproval by Catholic authorities. And, and John Courtney Murray comes along and says, no, in pursuit of, uh, of the common good, uh, as revealed by the natural law, he would say, a Catholic politician or, or a Catholic figure may function in a democratic government in order to try to work within a consensus to bring about good rather than evil. Right. Um, but that's a, and, that's a thundering argument because it, it basically is uh, the rejection of, uh, oh, I don't know, 1500 years of Catholic teaching. Right. I mean, the, the phrase that was often used against Murray, at least to represent the position that was opposed to Murray, which w was the idea that error has no rights, meaning that – if you're going to grant religious freedoms, other kinds of freedoms, you don't want to give people the freedom to do things that are sinful and therefore that are going to lead their souls to everlasting um, punishment, which, I mean, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a certain way in which Protestants can also resonate with that. And, and until the late 18th century with the American founding, the British – and other European countries also make provisions in some ways for dissenting groups to find their place into the political order. But, um, but in some ways, you know, I think Protestants would, would try to agree with that. And I think the Puritans also believe that in a way, of course, they were much farther back toward a, toward a more um, Christendom sort of model of basically we want to deny people the right to do things that are sinful. Um, but Rome holds on to that much longer, and it's only in Vatican II that the church revises that teaching. And, and it does make me wonder, just talking out loud here, I mean, I do know that theologians like a Calvin or an Edwards, you have a distinction between primary virtue and civic virtue. Primary virtues are the ones that come from a sanctifying faith um, that are genuinely lead to genuinely good works, whereas civic virtues are ones that are more external and outward. And I don't know the tradition of that in Roman Catholic teaching, but I could I could well imagine if you have this position going on as long as it did of error has no rights, it would be hard to formulate a civic virtue kind of position out of that. 
And it does also make me now wonder sometimes about ways in which certain bishops and the Pope himself these days can sound awfully universalistic in his affirmations of public truths or goods that sound like he's also saying these are saving in a, in a way, which I don't think he really means to say, because there is a difference between s- salvation kinds of goods and public ones. Well, I think that uh, it's not just this current Pope, Pope Francis, but, uh, but other Catholic authorities and theologians who uh, intentionally confuse that uh, and make, making arguments about more universal goods rather than uh, speaking more overtly uh, about what uh, previous popes would have called the economy of salvation, but but I, w- I want to tell a story and and get you to to uh, to, to relate this, and I want to take it a little bit further than you do in your book, by the way, because uh, I can't help but biography and autobiography intersecting here as well. So uh, as a as a young boy, as a Baptist growing up in a tall steeple Southern Baptist church in the Protestant establishment, and a church very much connected to Southern Baptist establishment, tied to the larger Protestant establishment, uh, I was taught a narrative about uh, the separation of church and state, and and, a, and what amounts to a rather radical secularism. And uh, so I became acquainted as a teenager with a group that, you know, sometimes uh, I'd, I'd see their magazine, Americans United for Separation of Church and State. And, and it was assumed that right-thinking evangelical Christians, and especially Baptists holding to a tradition of religious liberty, would, would agree with this, this position. But that, that was originally not so innocuously named. It wasn't originally Americans United for Separation of Church and State. It was Protestants and others united for separation of church and state. And it was the source of the most virulent anti-Catholicism. And then in trying to track that back, I realized that it includes people going all the way back to, to Ulysses S. Grant, you know, and then the Blaine Amendments. I mean, you got Ulysses S. Grant saying that one of the greatest, uh, you know, dangers to the United States is Roman Catholicism, and we we got to stop these parochial schools. Got to make ma- make sure that we starve them to death financially, uh, because uh, th- those are uh, incubating chambers for uh, totalitarianism, and uh, and European totalitarianism. And, and then you, you you fast forward to Al Smith and all the rest. Uh, that Protestants and others united for separation of church and state actually led much of Protestantism into a position of irrational secularism that, frankly, the Protestant left has never recovered from. Right. I think, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And it's, it's a fascinating history. And, and the latest iteration of uh, Americans United, of course, and I follow them on Twitter, not, not um, <clears throat> as obsessively as I follow some other things, but they've now turned to... Um, People who favor religious freedom are actually totalitarian. I mean, it's yeah. it's 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 quite a dramatic Christian thing. supremacists, right? And mm-hmm. and to have a Roman Catholic now in the White House, and they don't seem to pay any attention to this. Um, but but even going back to the point about public schools and what Grant said about parochial schools, John F. Kennedy, when he ran for president in, in 1960, and he explained himself to Protestant ministers in Texas in that famous speech. He says he believes in the absolute separation of church and state, and he is a he says a, um, dramatically that there will be no federal aid for parochial schooling, which used to be a, a very big deal. Now we've gone many iterations from that, and now charter schools are an option, and other kinds of you know homeschooling and whatnot. It's it's remarkable that the change in the landscape of of education right now. Um, but no, that's, that's a, a fascinating piece of Protestant and secular opposition to Rome and seeing a, a, um, a danger there that just, you know, I guess from the perspective of European Roman Catholicism, maybe it looked that way, but it's certainly not on the ground in the United mm-hmm. States. So I, I want to uh, test something with you. Um, you go back to the 1960 campaign, John F. Kennedy, uh, n- not on his own, so to speak, uh, not to deny his political skill, uh, but uh, d- due to the unbelievable ambition uh, and determination of his father, uh, Joseph P. Kennedy, and, uh, and others, he, he, he is catapulted into this position of national prominence. People forget that uh, 
you know, he was very disappointed that four years earlier he had not become the vice presidential nominee, although that probably saved him from a disaster so that he would gain the Democratic nomination in 1960, all kinds of things having to do, and Catholicism played a role in that, just ask Hubert Humphrey, uh, you know, who was branded as an anti-Catholic in order to, in West Virginia, in order to, to, to garner, you know, sympathy for, for John F. Kennedy. Uh, but when, when Kennedy goes to speak to that minister's association in Houston, and which it's sometimes identified as the Southern Baptist Pastors Association, it, it, and that's basically the nucleus of, of, of how that, that event came to be. Um, Kennedy was taking the bull by the horn, so to speak, and he went there and knew the question was going to be asked about whether or not he would have a final ultimate allegiance to, to Rome rather than to, say, the U.S. Constitution. He, he, he knew the rumors were out there. And, uh, and frankly, his advisors, as I understand, were basically split on the issue, but he decided he's going to go and he's going to say this. Now, what I want to set up is this. Um, people say that was a great moment for American Catholicism. And again, kind of following the Murray argument, he, he says he's an absolute proponent of separation of church and state. He's a, he's, he's a, a, a candidate for president who happens to be a Catholic. And, and like, this is the ultimate liberation. I'm not sure that changed the American Catholic posture in the United States all that much. Uh, it was massive for sure. But I think what it did do was give Americans be far beyond Catholicism, and I think of liberal Protestants in particular, an argument that they could use to basically secularize all of politics. Oh, interesting. I mean, because one of the <clears throat> consequences of I mean, there, there's a there's a real actually just to go back to that speech. There's a there's a genius to it. How much Kennedy himself was responsible, or his speechwriters, uh, Ted Sorensen being among them, um, that he reminds his audience, and if there are a, a fair number of Baptists among them, of uh, the kind of persecution that Baptists faced in 18th century Virginia. It's a really smart move and and it's really good i love using that speech in my classes here because because it ties moments together in american history um but you you were mentioning loose earlier and and the magazines from that era um the person who's on the cover roughly three weeks after of time after kennedy's election is john courtney murray um and this is still pre-Vatican II. I mean, I think by this point, John the 23rd, who's Pope, has called for the council, but they're still planning it. It doesn't begin until 1962. Murray's on the cover in 19, December 1960. And, you know, the, the, Kennedy also becomes a vehicle for Murray to become a prominent um, member of discussions among Roman Catholics about their place in American life. And, you know, and if this could go back to your earlier point that what Murray was doing was comparable to Bart in some ways, maybe selling out, selling out the church and its teachings in a certain way. But um, I guess the other factor I would throw in here is after World War II, as America was suburbanizing and many Roman Catholics were moving outside of the old ghettos in in the cities that the bishops had dominated during that one era of of Roman Catholic life. Um, I mean, Kennedy is sort of a exclamation point about making it in America and being comfortable in America. And if he could do it, and of course, he's an exceptional American by any, almost any standards, almost as uh, more exceptional than even someone like Buckley who comes from a very prominent background. But anyway, if he could do it, then Roman Catholics can. And since you've been autobiographical, I'll also just mention, <clears throat> I mean, I was, I was alive then. You, I don't know if you were alive when Kennedy, you may have just been born in 61. No, I was born in 59. 59. Yeah. But I can, we had Roman Catholic neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we had, a, I was a fundamentalist Baptist then. And, um, and, you know, we sort of knew that there was a difference. They went to parochial schools. Um, but, you know, there wasn't like this pulling out my, and my parents are very, very devout and very conservative and Republican, but there wasn't any sense of crisis, at yeah. least in the home, that this is somehow America had lost its bearings by this. 
Um, well, one of the things so, I do, Daryl, is, uh, is that uh, when I'm teaching, especially undergraduate classes, sometimes I will take the platform <laughs> of the Democratic Party, 1960, the platform of the Republican Party, 1960, and and take the the cover pages off and dare students to figure out which is which. It's nearly impossible. You have to know some really technical issues of debate in 1960 to be able to pick out the one from the other. That's how close yeah. the two parties were. Yeah. No, that's that's good. I, I want to come back to the 1960 speech by Kennedy because I, I I I was really curious. I don't remember when this happened, but you know, sometimes uh, I'm looking at a question, I'm reading, and then I think, you know, I really got to figure this out. So. A few years ago, I was looking back at that 19, uh, I was, I was looking at someone like, uh, 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 Gary Wills, actually, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was Gary Wills looking back at his treatment of the 1960 speech by Kennedy. And I thought, you know, what's missing from any of this analysis is the Catholic response to Kennedy's speech. Right. And I thought, you know, that's a question I really want answered. And and I could not find any books that uh, that readily got to that. So I decided, okay, I'm going to have to go back and look at the primary source material. So I went back in and started looking at it. And I saw immediately after Kennedy gave that speech that there were Catholic references in the Catholic uh, uh, periodical literature saying that that Kennedy was in direct conflict with the statement of the American bishops. And I thought, well, wait just a minute, what statement of the American bishop? So it took me a while, and I actually had to call some Catholic friends in order to figure this out, but I found that statement. And, and, and I'm going to read it to you. It's in the form of a dubium, you know, a question asked and, and the bishop's answer. Here it is. Could a president have one Catholic conscience for his private life and another public for his official life? The answer is negative, because the demands of integrity require him to be answerable to God for all his actions whether private or public, the reply would be negative in reference to any president, whatever his religious faith may be. When was that, Al? Well, it's in the 1960 uh, National Catholic Almanac. So if I understand it correctly, that was published before Kennedy gave his speech. And that's uh. why I saw people saying that's in conflict with the bishop's statement. Um, and uh, so anyway. That's fascinating. Yeah. Because I, I've also been curious with now with President Biden in office, and it's much easier to follow now, thanks to social media, how the bishops are reacting and how the press is covering the bishops' reactions to the president. And I've done some searching in some of the online sources for what magazines could pick up. I haven't gone in depth into Roman Catholic sources, um, but, you know, the Vatican II is also important for the ability of national conference conferences of bishops to form. Prior to Vatican II, as I understand it, the Vatican was very much reluctant to give national structures of bishops some kind of um, certainly not a conciliar structure. There were efforts after World War I for the American bishops to form something like that, and and and. The, the Vatican said no. And so what you now have is, is a conference of right. bishops. Not allowed to be called a council. Right. Um, so even then in, in the 60, in 1960, 61, with Kennedy's election and um, inauguration, it's not as clear that the bishops would have had a kind of vehicle that they, that they now have, say. And so I've actually looked some, too, in biographies of some of the prominent bishops, and especially the bishop of, uh, Archbishop of Boston, with whom um, Kennedy had relations. And it's really hard to find anything in the biographers of a, um, any kind of spiritual counsel, direction, disapproval of what Kennedy was doing as president. Well, I think it was very quiet. And again, I think if I follow the chronology correctly, this is the 1960 National Catholic Almanac. Cost me uh, more than I wanted to pay to get this guy to pay a copy. <laughs> but uh, so it's published in 1960, but it has the calendar for the church to follow in it. So I think it must have been er much earlier in the year, if not, if not you know, uh, it, it does say copyright in 1960. But uh, I, I I went to uh, sources at uh, at the University of Notre Dame just to ask them, you know, what does this mean? And and it was there that I I came to understand that this document is actually uh, 
approved by the Catholic bishops. In other words, th- th- this carries the official uh, status of being approved by uh, the Catholic. And as you say, that conference doesn't quite exist yet, so uh, I'm not sure how that was uh, that was indicated. But uh, nonetheless, this is treated in the United States as as a as an as, as document with not magisterial authority in Rome, but at least uh, Episcopal authority in the United States. But the thing that I was looking at again is, is what did Catholics think when Kennedy said you could split this? Because the other thing that, that I remember is 1984, when uh, and, uh, Mario Cuomo, you know, went to the University of Notre Dame and gave his address on being a Catholic in public life. And he basically, he went arguably far beyond Kennedy because he explicitly addressed the abortion issue. Which the Kennedy family is conservative on. I mean, uh, Senator Edward Kennedy was officially pro life in 1971. I mean, right down to from the moment of fertilization onward. Uh, but this shift had taken place. Uh, again, it was Jesuit thinkers, we, we now know, who uh, uh, met with the Kennedy family to help kind of negotiate that. But Mario Cuomo comes out in 1984 with this fact that you could basically have a, a dual life as a Roman Catholic politician. And the thing is, is that even then, there were prominent cardinals and archbishops of large dioceses who condemned Cuomo as as mm-hmm. basically being her openly heretical. Right. And, it, and I mean, I've been curious to see that Cuomo's, um, <laughs> the Cuomo in the news, of course, is, is his son, governor of New York State, not uh, that, that speech. And I, I've been waiting for someone in the Biden camp to, to pull it out. I mean, it's it just, it's right there ready for the pickings for a current Roman Catholic president to try it out. And, and I mean, even Ken Woodward, the longtime news reporter for uh, Newsweek, um, has been writing for First Things off and on. And he wrote a piece from 2015 or so about his interactions, interviews with Cuomo after that. It's a fascinating piece. And, you know, it seems like only someone like Ken Woodward remembers that Cuomo gave it. Um, well, or, pro- or evangelical Protestants like ourselves, uh, because it was it was to me, I thought, OK, here again, this is just this is what I grew up with seeing uh, in the form of Protestant liberalism. This is the very argument that, that was being made back then. Yes, the Bible teaches this, but I'm not under an obligation to hold to that position in my public life uh, in, in my 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 government stewardship. Um, and then Cuomo comes along and says it. But arguably right now with a, a far more liberal Demo- Democratic Catholic president, the second Catholic president of the United States. Uh, I mean, the Vatican just days ago had to warn the Catholic conference not to condemn the Catholic president of the United States. I mean, yeah. that's pretty astounding. It is. But, you know, going back to Kennedy's speech, too, one of the things that I do recall, I can't cite it chapter and verse, and it's it's a hypothetical, but I think to Kennedy's credit, he did say, if there comes a point at which my faith is out of line with what I need to do as president, I will resign the office. I mean, and you know, that's not something you hear much from any politician these days that uh, that their personal beliefs could actually require them to leave public life. Right. Fascinating stuff. I, I was kind of surprised that you had devoted so much time and scholarly attention to this question. I'm very pleased and really enjoyed the book. But, uh, I mean, you only have so many books in you and, uh, you know, in a, in a scholarly career, this was a, this was a major investment. And, uh, so, well, it, it was, I, I'm still fascinated by it. I mean, and having a president, uh, a Roman Catholic president now keeps that interest alive. And, um, and part of it is that I think I've become a better Protestant by study, studying Roman Catholicism because I, I can figure out areas in which I disagree and, and why and whatnot. But, but it's also just a, a very curious aspect of American life. I mean, when I teach religion in America, I, I devote sections of, of courses to Jewish Americans and Muslims and Mormons, and everybody has a story of how they have to work them, work out some kind of negotiation with American public life, Protestants less so because Protestants were sort of here to set the agenda. But then after that agenda is set, Later, Protestants have to come along and still make negotiations. It's a big part of history of America. So this was another chapter of it. So what are you working on now? Oh, another 
politics and uh, religion book. It's uh, Presbyterian Church, Government of All Things and British Politics in uh, both the UK and then North America. And it's actually quite, it's, it's sort of trying to figure out the degree to which Presbyterians, my tribe, were responsible for the American Revolution or not, which is something that King George said. And I think there's a lot of overstatement in that. But Presbyterians did help to execute a king, uh, or their arguments did at least, in 1649 with Charles I. So there's a difficult relationship of Presbyterianism in British politics that keeps resurfacing, and I'm trying to figure that out. Sharing mutual interests for uh, a very long time. Here's one Baptist is looking forward to uh, your next Presbyterian book. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks for joining me, Daryl. Appreciate you joining me for Thinking in Public. Well, it's really good to be with you and, and good to talk to you again, Al. Uh, it's a friendship that goes back a long way, and I, I appreciate it. I do as well. And God bless you. You too. Many thanks to my guest, Professor D.G. Hart, for thinking with me today. If you enjoyed today's episode of Thinking in Public, you can find more than 150 of these conversations at albertmuller.com under the tab Thinking in Public. For more information on the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, go to sbts.edu. For information on Boyce College, go to boycecollege.com. Thank you for joining me for Thinking in Public. Until next time, keep thinking. I'm Albert Muller.